Yasya Yato Nivyad Itaratas Charte Suavigyaswarat Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tejo Varimedam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Trisargo Mesha Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuvakam Satyam Param Dimahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, O all-pervading personality of Godhead, how from my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes, of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water, only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitra vutra paramo nirmatsananam satam vedyam vastavam atra vastu Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Kimba prayer ishwaraha. Sadyohide avarudya tetra. Krite behe shususubis takshanat. Completely reject all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from an illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatarur galitam phalam Sukamakad Amrita Dravya Samyutam Pibata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam Muhur Ahuraska Bhuvibhavakaha O expert and thoughtful man Ralashimad Bhagavatam The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful, even though its nectar and juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. 
Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidiantak Stu Bhadrani Vidunati Shahit Satam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta preesu abhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhaviti naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about the Bhagavatam from, from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo, kamalu badayas chaye, chete tair anavidan, stitfam sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso, Bhagavat bhakti yogataha, Bhagavat tattva vigyanam, Mukta sangha sujayate. When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya shiyante ca shikharmani drista evatmanishwari Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, verses 22 and Rajam Twayan Pristanam Rajam Twayan Pristanam Suhidam Nasuhit Pure Suhidam Nasuhit Pure Viprasapa Vimudanam Niganatam Mustabir Mita Varunim Madiram Pitva Varunim Madiram Pitva Madun Matita Chetasam Madun Matita Chetasam Ajanatam Ivan Yunyam Chatu Pancha Vasistita. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. O King, since you have asked me about our friends and relatives in the city of Dwarka, I will inform you that all of them were cursed by the Brahmanas, and as a result, they all became intoxicated with wine made of putrefied rice and fought among themselves with sticks 
not even recognizing one another. Now, all but four or five of them are dead and gone. All, now all but four or five of them are dead and gone. Text 24. Prayenaita Bhagavata. Prayenaita Bhagavata. Ishvarasya vichestitam. Mito niginanti bhutani. Mito niginanti bhutani. Bhava yanti chayanita. Translation, factually, all this is due to the supreme will of the Lord, the personality of Godhead. Sometimes people kill one another, and at other times they protect one another. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. According to the anthropologists, there is nature's law of struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. But they do not know that behind, behind the law of nature is the supreme direction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Bhagavad Gita is confirmed that the law of nature is executed under the direction of the Lord. Whenever, therefore, there is peace in the world, it must be known that it is due to the good will of the Lord. And whenever there is upheaval in the world, it is also due to the supreme will of the Lord. Not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Lord. Whenever, therefore, there is disobedience of the established rules enacted by the Lord, there is war between men and nations. And the surest way to the path of peace, therefore, is dovetailing everything. to the established rule of the Lord. The established rule is whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever we sacrifice, or whatever we give in charity, must be done for the full satisfaction of the Lord. Of the Lord. No one should do anything, eat anything, sacrifice anything, or give anything in charity against the will of the Lord. Discretion is the better part of valor. One must learn how to discriminate between actions which may be pleasing to the Lord and those which may not be pleasing to the Lord. An action is thus judged by the Lord's pleasure or displeasure. There is no room for personal whims. We must always be guided by the pleasure of the Lord. Such action is called yoga karma su koshalam, or actions performed which are linked with the Supreme Lord, that is the art of doing a thing perfectly. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So this is a great purport, and it echoes what Prabhupada writes also in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where he explains the art of work Yoga Koshalam. And there he says, Yoga Stak Kurukaramani Sangam Tyakva Dananjaya Siddhya Siddhyo Samo Budva Samadvam Yoga Uchyate. He says, Perform your duty equipoised, O Arjuna abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. And then he says, Dure nahi avaram karma, buddhi yoga tananjaya, buddho saranam anvicha kripana fala hetavaha. O dananjaya, keep all abominable activities far distant by devotional service, and in that consciousness surrender unto the Lord. Those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. And then he says, Buddha Yoga Jahatiha Ube Sukrite Duskrite Tasmat Yoga Yujasva Yoga Karma Sukoshalam 
so that yoga karma shukushalam is the art of work. And he says, a man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad actions, even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. And Prabhupada writes, since time immemorial, each living entity has accumulated the various reactions of his good and bad work. As such, he is continuously ignorant of his real constitutional position. One's ignorance can be removed by the instruction of the Bhagavad Gita which teaches one to surrender unto Lord Sri Krishna in all respects and become liberated from the chained victimization of action and reaction, birth after birth. Arjuna is therefore advised to act in Krishna consciousness, the purifying process of resultant action. So this art of work, that means in every step you become free of karma rather than the disaster of selfish work. In every step, you become more and more entangled in the laws of karma. So, uh, therefore, karma jam buddhi yukta hi falam tyakva dananjaya chanmagbanda vinir mukta padam gachanti anamayam. By thus engaging in devotional service to the Lord, great sages or devotees free themselves from the results of work in the material world. In this way, they become free from the cycle of birth and death and attain the state beyond all miseries by going back to Godhead. So, in material life, there's danger in every step. Material life means ignore Krishna and think that we are independent and by our own endeavors we can achieve uh, dominance over the material nature. That, of course, is not factual. So, samasrita ye padapalapavam mahat padam punya yasu murari bhavan budhir vatsa padam param padam 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 yat vipadam natisam. For one who has accepted the boat of the lotus feet of the Lord, who is the shelter of the cosmic manifestation and is famous as Mukunda or the giver of mukti, liberation, the ocean of the material world is like the water contained in the calf's hoof print. Parampadam, or the place where there are no material miseries, or vaikunta, is his goal, not the place where there is danger in every step. So, this is a description of material life without Krishna consciousness. There's danger in every step. And Material life in which one dedicates everything, yet kurosi yadasinasi, yet jahosi dadasi, yet tapasya sikontea, tat kurusva madarpanam. So, everything you do, everything you eat, and everything you offer in charity, and everything you uh, give away, uh, every, every, everything you offer and devotion, and everything you give away, and all austerities that we perform, these, all these things should be done for the pleasure of Krishna. Subha, subha, phaleri, mam, moksya, sikarma, bandhanai, sanyasya, yoga, yukta, atma, vimukto, mam, upaisyasi. If you do this, then everything auspicious and inauspicious is uh, eliminated. And by this principle of renunciation, one attains liberation from the cycle of birth and death. So, all of this is, is explanation of the, the art of work. The art of work, every, everything you do leads you toward liberation from the cycle of birth and death, liberation from laws of karma, liberation from the destructive nature of time, and liberation from the modes of material nature, and that's only possible by unalloyed devotional service. Uh, so if one engages in devotional service unfailingly, unflinchingly, and does not fall down under any circumstances, 
rises up above the influence of the modes of material nature and comes to the level of Brahman, where there's no more uh, lamentation, no more hankering, and uh, so one is equally disposed to, toward all living entities. So that is a state, uh, that's the beginning state of liberation. There are other states above that, but that's the preliminary stage to become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. So uh, nothing can ha happen in this material world without the will of the Lord. That's the understanding of the devotee. So uh, whenever there's peace in the world, Prabhupada says, it must be known that it is due to the good will of the Lord. And whenever there's upheaval in the world, it is also due to the supreme will of the Lord. Not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Lord. Whenever, therefore, there is disobedience of the established rules enacted by the Lord, there is war between men and nations. So that's what we're seeing uh, over and over again. Uh, the materialists try and find ways to analyze what's happening. So you have uh, different types of philosophers, just like this German philosopher Hegel. He came up with the theory of dialectic. Dialectic means a way to understand the, uh, the past or history. And, and history always repeats itself so you can understand the future also through what he called the what, uh, Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. That means there is a certain, uh, let's say, culture. Culture means the way people do things. And then there's the opposite uh, that comes up. Just like you have a capitalistic society in the United States, and the opposite is Occupy Wall Street or no justice, no peace, or black lives matter, you know, and, and so you have the thesis, the, the one thing, capitalism, and then you have the opposite of it. Uh, let's destroy Wall Street, let's destroy capitalism. And then something new comes out of it. It's a, it's a, 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 uh, the thesis, thesis, antithesis, which is the opposite, and then synthesis. Somehow it is a blending of those two things and something new comes out of it. Well, that's one way of looking at, at uh, history and how things and why things happen. But the actual way is not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Lord. So whenever there's disobedience of the established rules enacted by the Lord, there's war between men and nations. And whenever there is peace, uh, that's the mercy of the Lord. And it's usually because people are following the rules and regulations given by Krishna. So then Prabhupada says, the surest way to the path of peace, therefore, is dovetailing everything to the established rule of the Lord. The established rule is that whatever we do, yet karosi yadasnasi, whatever we eat, whatever sacrifices or whatever, whatever we give in, Charity must be done to the full satisfaction of the Lord. Okay, so this is the correct way to analyze history. And, and if we look at it through the prism of Krishna consciousness, we don't make a mistake. If we look at it uh, in the way Hegel explained it, and by the way, Hegel influenced Marx and he influenced many, many people with his dialectic, his way of analyzing history, but it's a wrong analysis. Uh, why? Because anything minus Krishna is wrong. Anything plus Krishna will most probably be right. So Hegel is everything minus Krishna. So although it sounds good, it's actually no good. So whatever we eat, whatever we sacrifice, or whatever we give in charity must be done to the full satisfaction of the Lord. So this is the established rule. 
No one should do anything, eat anything, sacrifice anything, or give anything in charity against the will of the Lord. Discretion is the better part of valor. So this is a very famous English proverb. It comes from Latin, actually. So discretion is the better part of valor. What does that mean? So when you understand Krishna consciousness, and you understand that Krishna is the, uh, the reality in everything. And without Krishna, there's no reality. There's, there's just a, a illusory understanding. Then you, you make decisions based on pleasing Krishna. Uh, so that means that you become a brave and valorous and courageous person because you're not afraid to make the right decision based on Krishna consciousness. So discretion is the best part of valor. When you make decisions based on uh, the absolute truth, uh, then you are actually a real functioning person. But if you make decisions based on speculation, you're not uh, a real person, you're, you're a phony. You uh, always end up with the wrong conclusion and it just causes suffering. So therefore, one must learn how to discriminate between actions which may be pleasing to the Lord and those which may not be pleasing to the Lord. Anukuliyasya sankalpa pratikuliyasya varjanam. In other words, you should do only, we should only do things that are pleasing to the Lord and avoid doing anything that is not pleasing to the Lord. <clears throat> so that is a basic criterion for good judgment. So an action is thus judged by the Lord's pleasure or displeasure. So, so th these are fundamental things that we should teach our kids. So, and we do, I, I, always, uh, I always give them seven points by which you can understand if something is good or bad. One, uh, is the action you're, under, you're considering going to be pleasing to Krishna or is it not pleasing to Krishna? And uh, and will uh, can I make this? Can I offer this action to Krishna, uh, or uh, is it not offerable to Krishna? Right. And then uh, also, uh, will my spiritual master be pleased by this action? And uh, will the result be that people become enlivened in Krishna consciousness? Or will the result be that people will become discouraged and go away from Krishna consciousness? So these are all types of, uh, let's say, fundamental points that we should understand in order to make a right decision. So there's no room, Prabhupada says, for personal whims we must always be guided by the pleasure of the Lord. Such action is called yoga karma sakoshalam, or the actions performed which are linked with the Supreme Lord that is the art of doing a thing perfectly. So, so many people have come up with theories how to act perfectly. Rene Descartes came up with a whole uh, rational uh, process of how to make the right decision. But yet he made major mistakes in his life. <laughs> Even though he came up with what he claimed to be a perfect system of rationality by which you never make a mistake. But of course, he made mistakes. So this is the proper way. We should always act guided by the pleasure of the Lord. And, and then we will not make a mistake in life. Hare Krishna. Of course, the Sila Prabhupada Kija. Are there any questions? What is the understanding of the those anthropologists? Or, you know, of the, what, what is the understanding of nature? 
Prabhupada says, first of all, all the archaeologists, all archaeologists are nonsense. Right. right. Because they believe in a Darwinian theory. And they believe that, you know, we all come from single cell uh, beings or things. And eventually, through tri trial and error over a long period of time, and then later they added on through mutations and so forth, genetic mutations. Human beings appeared, right? So that whole theory is junk. There's no truth to it at all. But that's the basis of their archaeological, let's say, perspective of life. So they think the farther back you go, the more primitive things are. However, when you look at language, it's the opposite. The farther back you go, the more complicated it is. <laughs> Say, you go back to Sanskrit, it's, it's perfect language. You know, it has declensions and conjugations and so much subtleties and such uh, perfect grammar, and, you know. So, you know, you would think, you know, the farther back you go, you just hear the uh, 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 grunts, you know. <laughs> People communicated through grunting like animals. You know, that's a bunch of nonsense. They're all false theories. So that's why uh, the, their whole outlook on the world view is wrong. So then your question again about the archaeologist? Yeah, what is, what is the, the understanding? I actually said anthropologist. Yeah, anthropologist. Those who study anthro, the humanity. Yeah. So what is the understanding of nature? Uh, nature is a struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. See, this is, this is Darwin, the Darwin's the theory. That's, the law. That's the their law. understanding. That's their perspective. It doesn't mean it's true. That's their perspective. And that's Darwin's theory. Survival of the fittest. People are always, uh, things progress due to the struggle for existence. But the struggle for existence is because people are trying to dominate nature that doesn't belong to them, and it's indomitable. In other words, you cannot dominate nature. Nature is gunamai. It belongs to Krishna. It's, it's invincible. You cannot... We are part of nature, so you cannot overcome it. You see. Only the creator of all these things can, and who's controlling it, and unless you surrender to the creator of these things, you cannot overcome it. So the, the whole point is that everything is minus Krishna. So their theory of the anthropologist does not take Krishna into account. They say it's just this push-pull laws in nature, and there's a struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. The big fish eats the little fish. Okay, they come up all these theories, but then what is the purpose, what is the solution, what is the bright future, according to the, uh, you know, the theories. They, often, they only analyze, they analyze the, the nature, laws of nature, and they did not offer anything for well, that's a very good question. That's the whole point. They, an they analyze what they think is the problem, even though th their analysis is wrong, but they don't propose any positive uh, solution. No, the analysis is not wrong, Maharaj, because they say it's true that the, the, the survival of the fittest through the material world is struggle, is that? But the, they don't understand why it's happening. Right. Because people are in an illusion. They think that they can conquer material nature through science or through, I don't know, any type of uh, technique that they come up with. Like caveman supposedly had clubs, you know. So they take the club and they, they, uh, they beat an animal to death and eat it, right? So that's their way of uh, solving the problem of life. Eating, right? <laughs> so, see, when Prabhupada says, but they do not know that behind the law of nature 
is the supreme direction of the supreme personality of Godhead. That's the whole point. That's why they don't have a solution. Yeah, they see the struggle going on. You know, the right. big fish eats the little fish, right? So then they try and come up with some type of theory why it's happening. But what they don't understand is that uh, they understand the law, but they don't understand the maker of the law, the lawmaker. If there's a law, that means someone made it, right? Because the law is yes. predictable, right? You can predict this is going to happen over and over again. So what, how come, who, you know, if there's a law, who made the law? Uh, no, they don't talk about that. <laughs> In other, in other words, they don't really know the cause of the whole issue. Well, what they don't know is the struggle for existence is unnecessary. It's an artificial thing due to ignorance. Yes. They think, well, this, this is just the way life is. And we have to overcome it with our different strategies, you know. With, digital technology or with atom bombs or with tanks and machine guns or something, you know. See, so they, they don't understand what is behind everything. They don't understand the cause. The cause for them is, is, is not really important. What's important is dealing with what they see is, is the problem. But if you don't understand the cause, you won't understand the solution either. Or stop death. That's their purpose is to stop death. I mean, the diseases, they, they don't find a means to stop diseases, but they're trying to find a means to cure the diseases. Well, if you don't understand the cause, then you will not understand the cure. Right? The cure is that we're trying to compete with God rather than surrender. If you surrender, then all the problems will go away. But if we keep trying to compete, then uh, the problems get worse. It's really so it, it's, it here it says, according to the anthropologists, mm -hmm. those people who study humanity, right? There is nature's law of struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. But they do not know that behind the law of nature is the supreme direction of the supreme personality of Godhead. Is that so nice? Because you say something very good. If it is a law, who made that law? Yes. So my question was exactly based on that. For them, what is the this laws of nature? But then what is the... No, one, let me tell you something very interesting. Okay. If you look up the... Uh, uh, history of science, right? you'll see that scientists all agree that nature functions in an orderly way. They all agree to that. Yeah. That's why they can do science, right? right. If, if nature was completely haphazard all the time, there wouldn't be any science. Right. You, you wouldn't be able to see uh, patterns, you know, models, you know. So, if nature is orderly, how did that happen? You know, did, did it happen by accident? That's what they say. You know, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's a crazy idea that it all happened by accident. Whereas anything they do that's ordered, someone did it. That's why I put that question, because what is the understanding of nature, the order of nature? Well, so this, this really should be uh, discussed along with no, but they, if you look up on the internet about science, right, mm -hmm. you'll see their fundamental assumption is that nature functions in an orderly way. Yeah. That's the, I mean, you would, they would not be able to do science if nature was always random. But they say that through infinite number of random 
permutations and combinations, order came. <laughs> well, they weren't there to know, right? So they're just guessing. But their guess defeats the premise that they have, that nature is orderly. You, you, don't, you don't develop order through randomness. But still, if people tell them, you see, there's a God behind it. And that they refuse. Yeah, exactly. You see, that's, that's really pathetic. Why? No, the, all this has been codified by the demoniac scientists to eliminate God. If you look at the history of the world, in, in the Western world, at one point, the Catholic Church was controlling everything in society. The capitalism. Cap Catholic Church. Oh, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. You know, once the, cat, the, the Christians took over the Roman Empire or whatever was left of it, they controlled everything. You couldn't move without, without their permission, right? And, uh, and they came up with crazy theories that, that later on by science, were pro by scientific research, were proven to be wrong. And then when, once the scientists started coming up with things that proved the Catholic, like for, for example, the Catholic Church insisted that the sun is going around the earth. The earth is not going around the sun. And the earth is the central point of the whole creation. And then Copernicus and some other uh, you know, the scientists, they, they proved that the earth is going around the sun. And the Catholic Church at first would you know, threaten to kill them. You know, and, and then eventually, you know, they, they, they gave in. So many things that, like for example, if you go to Rome today, to the, and you look at the Sistine Chapel, this is like, when you get into Rome, uh, when you get into the Catholic, uh, you know, center of Catholicism, uh, you know, it's a beautiful, gigantic church, right? And in the, the main part of it is called the Sistine Chapel. And on the roof of it is a gigantic painting that Michelangelo made of the creation. And it shows a picture of God. He's an old man with gray hair and wrinkles. Now, why did he paint God as an old man in wrinkles? That's what the Pope told him is God. And, they, and they're basing it on something that They've speculated from the Bible, you see. But, but what, what does God look like? Navayovanamcha. He is uh, always a pristine youth. He never grows old, you see. So the Catholic Church had it wrong in many ways and still does. And w when they did scientific research, when it started developing in the Middle Ages, it became clear that they, the, the assumption, many assumptions that they made was wrong. And then on top of all that, the Catholic Church engaged in uh, uh, persecutions, burning people, burning, uh, declaring certain people to be witches, and they burned them, they killed them, and there were wars. And finally, you know, uh, the scientists and politicians, they decided we're gonna, we're finished with the Catholic Church. We're gonna put them in their place now and gonna, you know, not let them have all this power and money and control over the society. And they did it, you see, they did it. I mean, the Catholic Church is still powerful, but uh, they curtailed its power. I mean, especially in France, they seized all their properties. You know, and, uh, and then uh, in communist countries, they decided who's gonna be the the priests and you know and the priests were all communist members of the communist party or they were loyal to the communist party <laughs> they completely they decided to just just you know completely harness and and uh, tie up no they well no they're not members they they're not exactly the members I'm not sure. 
Anyway, the communists were choosing who was going to be the leader of the church in their country. And that person had to be loyal to the communist party. Why they call them, uh, I can't remember the name again. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, you can look it up. Anyway, you see, uh, just like Prabhupada is, con is uh, arguing, uh, is explaining how anthropologists have gotten it wrong, uh, the uh, religionists also got many things wrong. And over time, through science, they had to uh, admit that, uh, you know, they were wrong. So, what is right? See, what is right is, but they do not know that behind the law of nature, the law of this struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, is the supreme direction of the supreme personality of Godhead. And the other thing they don't know is the survival of the fittest, the, the laws, uh, the, this sort of, uh, you know, law of, of struggle for existence is not, is not unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. Suffering is completely unnecessary. It's only due to ignorance. It's, it's, it's illusory, yeah. Yeah, a anthropologists and archaeologists, they base everything on Darwin's theory. You see? So it's all wrong. They, whatever theory they have, it's always minus Krishna. So it's going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. We've discussed a lot of things today. <laughs> Just like Hegel and his theory of uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis.